This is going to be a very interesting talk. I, I saw the slides in preview, so it's going to be really interesting. Um, <laughs> uh, the, the speaker is uh, Peter Coyle. Peter is uh, one of the co-members of the Luxembourg Data Science uh, Meetups. Uh, he is involved in PyData for quite a few years, and he contributed to some um, data science code and tools such as Pandas or the PMF for Hackers, which is a freely available books uh, for um, Bayesian statistics and probabilities. So please welcome the speaker. So thank you very much. Uh, very happy to speak here at the first Pi Data Conference or Pi Data Track in Italy. Um, I'm going to be talking about data products. A data product is simply something that leverages uh, mathematics and data, hides it from a user and provides a use to them. I'm going to give a few examples from industry. I'm also going to talk about an example I worked on myself in the air traffic industry. Um, there's my email address. We'll get back to this at the end. Uh, all opinions, my own standard display disclaimer. Okay, so who am I? This has already been quickly introduced by uh, Valerio. Um, mm -hmm. Master's in mathematics, specialized in statistics. I interned at Amazon working in their supply chain team on some infantry control problems. Um, I was a consultant for a while. It's a very eye-opening experience when you first work with uh, people with a lower uh, technical expertise and the challenges that we have then. And I was an analytics product architect on this one product I'm going to talk about, and the pandas and the various other things. And that's my Twitter handle there. So first experience when, you're, when you first work as a data scientist with a strong mathematical background is you get a response that makes it look like you're landed from the planet Zorg. Vector spaces, what do you mean? And when you spend a lot of time in mathematics grad school, you forget that normal people do not know what a functional space is and what a Bayesian statistic is and stuff like this. So how do you transfer this value of data to them? We can't agree what data science it is. One of the common uh, uh, discussions at data science conferences is, can we define this yet and all this here sort of stuff. Um, plenty of vendors will give you a quick answer, which is mostly buy our product. Um, <laughs> but I think it's mostly about transferring um, mathematics and domain-specific knowledge into a solution for end users. And I, the solution should ideally be a product. Depending on the situation, it does vary. So Sean J. Taylor, who some of you may know because you follow him on Twitter, is a research scientist at, at Facebook. And he's been in the data science uh, community for a while as well. And he's been talking about, and I quite like this idea, of the pipeline, right? So when I was studying mathematics and, and uh, doing a master's thesis in university, I was definitely up here in basic research. Um, never answered the question, what is this used for in the mathematics department? Um, and then you generally, if you move into industry, you might be able to use that. Most of my career as a consultant and the various other things I've done has been on the working prototype stage. And one of the challenges I wanted to get over was how do you get it into a tool or a service, working with software engineers to produce a product and all the various challenges that produces, you know, such as uh, operational excellence, good performance code, good API designs, et cetera, et cetera. And when you study mathematics, they don't teach you that stuff. <laughs> so how do analysts serve the business? So this is uh, the recommendation engine of my former employers. Um, this tells you far too much about my book uh, buying habits. Uh, feel free to buy me any of these. <laughs> They're on my wish list. Um, and this one way is through a data product. And this is one we interact with day in, day out. When you're telling people what you do, I generally talk about recommendation engines because everybody's encountered these. And these, um, this here slide comes from Y Hat. And I'm going to talk about them because I use their product. Um, uh, they're really cool guys based in New York, really solving data science operational problems. Um, basically, problems they've run into themselves. So this is one of the challenges here. You've got a roughly a life cycle, right? And you get a strategic insights, and you give a presentation, and I find all this wonderful stuff. And then people say, oh, that's great. 
Um, but when you give someone something they can use, that's something more powerful. That's, oh, you're not just wasting me money. Um, that's something they can interact with. And you, you're also, you're broadening your audience. You know, this is something, I used to be a teacher, and one of the things I've always been passionate about is how do you broaden your audience? How do you, you know, empower people, you know, at the various levels of technical expertise to take advantage of these sort of trends that we're seeing that are really exciting? These are sort of fundamental principles that I've, I was thinking about. And whenever I went into this project and I'll talk about, these were at the back of my mind. So to help the business the most, models have to be in production. Uh, you know, it's not quite the same as academia when you, know, you, know, you produce the most value by getting the most citation counts. But whenever you're trying to help industry, when models are in production and being used, that's a really powerful thing. And that's what the real innovation stuff that people are talking about. Some of us call this a data product. I know DJ Patel, who's now the chief data scientist in, uh, based in the White House, has very strong opinions on this. He recently wrote a few blog posts about this and his experience at LinkedIn. So in this talk, I'm going to talk about how we, I use science ops from Wyatt. And the final one's a bit cheeky, but why should Amazon or Google have all the fun or the competitive advantage? And that's one of the things. That when you're at a smaller firm or with smaller stakeholders, you've got to think about the operational load that getting these things into production and how you empower your analysts to get things into production as quickly as possible. Because the skill sets are sufficiently different. I'm going to talk a bit more about this, the skill set between software engineers and statisticians. I think one of the reasons why we get very confusing job spec for data scientists, which is something like a unicorn mixed with a monkey, I don't know. Um, you know, like 10 years of Java programming plus a statistics PhD, all these sort of things. You don't find that in one person. You find that in a group of people and how do you empower them using good tooling, such as the stuff that uh, Y Hat have been working on. And there's various other examples. And I already mentioned Sean Taylor earlier on, but he calls this the last mile problem. That's the fundamental challenge we all have. How do you translate the insight, the insight that an expert like myself gets? into something people can use. And these are, of course, more white hat slides. So you get lots of conversations like this. Um, we need to reduce churn. I'll look into it. Yeah, everybody who approaches me has a briefcase. Um, <laughs> um, and then you have this moment, right? And I, I've already said this earlier on, the sort of problem of language, you know, especially when you internalize these things. Um, the ha, home, ha moment is in the end. You know, complex vector spaces, you know, uh, sounds good, let's do this. And this is actually the first time I worked with a software team. It looked a bit like this. You know, I don't think it was gradient boosting, but it was something else. Um, and that's the thing, right? You've got sort of two tribes here. You know, when you're a scientifically motivated programmer, you learn pandas, scipy, numpy. You learn all these things. You learn all the intricacies of numerical analysis. You learn intricacies of machine learning development. You know, you learn that's a really valuable skill, but only a valuable skill if it's in a product, right? So when I first interacted with software engineers, they sort of looked at me as if, like I said, from Planet Zork. Um, uh, and, and because they're generally, web development is an art in itself. There's a lot of good tooling. We, you know, there's a lot of, you know, we have a Django track at this event, and there's no one here from there. You know, but how do you bridge the gap? And that was the sort of thing that I was thinking about and, um, and, and being challenged by. So it's hard to co incorporate data into day-to-day -day operations. You know, when something's up and running, when something can be sort of left. You know, you can easily get into the stage when, and I've had this myself, when you're kind of like producing results by reporting, but you're actually just pushing the thing on the, you know, the, the enter key on the keyboard, changing a few parameters. You know, that's not enough. That doesn't get yourself out of the picture. And data scientists are not software engineers. Everything here is very opinionated, as you can see, um, although it's not acknowledged by some. Producing models and code is an art in itself. And it's not the same as a, as a good web application. And you, know, you need certain things like domain-specific knowledge of model building or, or the challenges of you know, so, does something, you know, 
the example I'm going to talk about is actually an ordinary differential equation problem, but you've got all sorts of things like, does your solutions converge in the right amount of time? Have you parameterized your space correctly? Have you broken down the problem in the right way? All the sort of things that end up in big, huge, specialized textbooks that professors like to throw at poor master students. Or and D is not equal to engineering. Um, when I was uh, preparing these slides, I showed them to Ian Oswald, who runs the Pi Data Meetup and Pi Data Conference in London. And Ian has uh, 10 years of experience of running into these challenges day in, day out. And he told me R&D is not equal to engineering. And I like that as a succinct summary. One of the things I've realized is how do you communicate that to your stakeholders? Um, you know, a web application has, you know, sort of, Certain elements of it are web well developed problems, but a machine learning model, I don't think we're there yet. You know, maybe for certain sub problems, like some elements of customer churn, but then it depends on which particular area you're working in in the data science world. Um, the takeaway is make sure your stakeholders are ready for such high risk, high reward pro projects. Hiring data scientists is hard, as anyone who's ever sat on the committee. This is Drew Conway's uh, famous Venn diagram. And I like this as a succinct summary. And I like to uh, steal stuff from other people. But um, he's right in that you know, how do you bridge you know, the substantial expertise into your problem development? You know, all these things are challenges in themselves. And that's one of the things that whenever you're mentoring young data scientists is you know, to try to develop all these sort of areas. But there's a follow-up thing that's even harder. Building applications with their insights is a lot tougher. Largely because of the different uh, uh, skill sets people have, different languages to speak, different mental models. You know, fundamentally, it comes down to different mental models. When I was developing a model, models professionally, what I realized is that a lot of people think of a model as a feature, but a model is a lot more intricate and complicated and multifaceted than that. And communicating that is, is important. But also, you have to think about the challenges of budget and how you use tooling to solve this. So why? So I'm going to use my own version of the data science pro process because I love my own acronyms. I used to be a consultant. I love acronyms. Um, but the data science process involves something like OSOMIC, obtain, scrub, explore, model, interpret, and communicate. And you notice I've added the last part here as opposed to the Chris Wiggins and Hillary Mason example. But I think the interpret stage, like for a domain-specific expert, and the communicate when it's handed off into a product or handed off into something that is like a good visualization. We've seen some new examples of good visualizations here uh, today. But that's, that's a follow-up stage. Because my interpretation is very nuanced and technical and largely resorts to my own specialized knowledge. But how do you communicate that? And how do you design good data products? is one way to do that. So there's, there's, and there's all sorts of challenges that you run into that. Like in this the project, pro, uh, project I'm going to talk about, there were like date time errors. They were, you know, there was a data source from a US that was in feet, and there was a data source from Europe that was in meters. And these things screwed up NASA's projects, and I'm not as smart as they are. You know, so, you know, these are the sort of things that you have to do with. And building a model involved porting code from MATLAB and understanding a new domain-specific problem. API data sources were messy and hard to understand. So case study. Case study, that's a problem description. The client was working on a visualization tool and needed to provide the results of differential equation, an ordinary differential equation that was coupled um, uh, and was describing what is a kind of turbulence called wake vortex turbulence. Wake vortex turbulence is a turbulence that is caused by airplanes flying through the, uh, uh, through the air, subject to certain meteorological conditions. I'm not going to do the domain specific stuff now in the talk, but you can grab me afterwards. But these sort of things are, with the, ri with the rise of air traffic and the rise of new larger aircraft, is becoming more and more of a safety and insurance uh, issue. 
So there was clearly a, a, a business need in a specific domain uh, area. Now, what was interesting about this is that in the data science community, we mostly talk about machine learning problems or statistics problems. But I hadn't seen many examples of how you talk about proper like mathematical models you know, in, in the old-fashioned sense of ordinary differential equations. Research problem was already done. So after the code was prototyped in Python, what next? One key ingredient was in the mathematical engine had to be incorporated into a product, and the devs were in Ruby on Rails and JavaScript. And I tried to convince them and change them to other languages, but they generally hit me on the head with a fish. Um, and the challenge is there one, one uh, like interoperability. You know, how do you match make? How do you blend these two worlds together and these two skill sets that I've already highlighted that are sufficiently different? And you're going to run into these things sooner or later. So these are some possible solutions. First one proposed was port code to Java. Always a good thing to mention at a Python conference. But you've got huge things uh, here of cross-language validation. And this is also something that a lot of stakeholders don't really have a good mental model for. You know, I'll just rewrite that code is a very good way to add two years to a project, um, depending on the size and complexity of the code base. PMML, I don't know if any of you in the audience are familiar with it, but it's predictive, predictive, predictive modeling markup language. And uh, the reason that I mentioned this was I wrote this talk first and gave it in Luxembourg in response to someone who told me that PMML was the solution to all my problems. And ignore people who say things like that. Um, so it doesn't have great language support. Now, now, some teams like Netflix in their own data products like uh, uh, infrastructure do use PMNL, but they also have a huge like, team devoted to maintaining those scripts and building these tools. Unfortunately, I don't have their budget. I'd love it, but um, batch jobs, you would have high maintenance and config. And then the other thing that came up was more models, write the models in Ruby. Turns out Ruby doesn't have an ODE solver, which is a scientific programmer offends me, but um, I'm not going to fix that anytime soon. But these are fundamentally more tools, more work, more time. So I, as I said, I used to teach. So my first solution was to sit all the devs down and try to teach them advanced ordinary differential equations. This didn't go so well. It looked a little bit like this. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, uh, and I hope someone in the audience recognizes that, that what these equations actually are about. Um, and then the conversation came a bit like this. I don't want more math, just give me an API. Um, very direct uh, point. Um, partitioning or Microsoft service architecture is a good software design, so why not do that? Well, at this stage, I was getting towards the end of the time limit on this project. And when someone says you just write an API and you've got about two weeks left, you're kind of there. That's not going to be as easy as a science. And then, of course, you get the boss who comes in and says something <laughs> like, 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 like this. If you could write an API in one day, that would be great. So what does every young, smart data scientist do when they run into a problem? <laughs> so I did this. I, I used Google to enlighten me about what tools were available. I really had already partitioned the problem here, right? The model was there. model was prototype, satisfied the domain-specific experts who were internal of that it was uh, solving differential equation correctly. The devs had already built the architecture of the front end and back end. There were lots of APIs coming in, so they'd already done some simple cal calculations. And then the challenge is, how do you blend the two to do the real value add? The real value add in this project, you know, pulling a bunch of stuff from APIs and doing fancy graphs is not quite as exciting as building a proper mathematical modeling engine. 
and I found these guys who I mentioned earlier on. Uh, because I began to ask the question about what tooling can I as a data scientist use to get stuff into prod? You know, I didn't want to, to, to spend my innovation tokens on load balancers. I wanted to spend my innovation tokens, which I only get three apparently um, <laughs> in my life. Um, but I wanted to spend my innovation tokens on building a mathematical modeling engine and solving this here, the main specific problem, and not dealing with all that crap about EC2. I could use the stuff from Y Hat HQ, um, and Y Hat HQ is their official name, Y Hat is their logo, just if the case there's not any confusion, to build a model as a service. You know, we've had a lot of things like software as a service, models as a service, that's what I'm really excited about. As someone who struggled with the last mile problem, I talked about the last mile problem earlier on here from Sean Taylor, um, this is really eye-opening for me. This tooling investment improved my productivity dramatically. So what are the key tenets of this solution? Work with the tools you already know. You know, adding an extra tool, you know, to just learn another tool is, is something we love to do as, uh, as techies because we, we love to learn things. But it's a really, really great way to waste budget. You know, it was a really, really great way to add to the risk of a project. You get to iterate quickly. You know, there's nothing better than building up that rapport with your stakeholders who don't really understand what you do, despite what they will tell you. You know, you know, because they really do think as you as an expensive math person in the corner. You know, I'm not really sure why he's here. But um you know, you get to iterate quickly, you've got to provide value to the stakeholders and get interest from them and, and also use that feedback to develop the model better. I was chatting to um, Eddie Bell, who's at List, and Eddie Bell is a senior data scientist at List. List is a fashion uh, e-commerce website based in uh, Silicon Roundabout, I think, in London. And he was talking about the same challenge, right? How do you take, like, in his case, an ML problem, but how do you take that, get that into production and learn from the domain-specific experts who are going to notice things that you're just never going to notice, you know, whether things are out of bounds or whatever, or because especially because what they've given you in terms of their spec is very vague in the first place. You know, building up that rapport with people is really important. Low touch, low operational load. You know, adding operational load to a project is a great way to increase headcount. That's also a great way to use budget. Um, and, and, but that's something I didn't have in, for this particular project. I, I didn't have those resources. And no rewriting of code. You know, as I said earlier on, like rewriting code, you know, is is a great way to add to complexity because what works in one language doesn't work in another, right? The, the the one of the great things we have in the Python community is we are leveraging years and years of linear algebra and like uh, differential equation research that are like wrapped around by the Python libraries, right? So if you look at the scikit-learn. Um, example, you know, you'll see that they're actually using stuff that, you know, a lot of the underlying stuff like lib SVM was developed in the 80s or something like that. You know, so they're really, you know, wrapping around stuff. And it means it extends to be tested and it works very well. So, this is the Wake Vortex project. This is my uh, underlying architecture. Um, the person there is a pilot, in case this is not clear. Um, but they're the kind of people who would use this sort of thing. So they, would, they would input uh, uh, their parameters of their, of their airplane or even their safety staff to find out what potential risks they have during their flight path. Um, the Awake uh, stuff is uh, pl runs on the DigitalOcean platform as a service. Ruby on Rails app pulls in stuff from lots of nice APIs. Um, one that Euro control, one geographical data, uh, and one that tells things like flight path information. And the 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 mathematical, the data science part here is that it calls my service that I designed and architected 
which was a wake solver. So solve this complicated mathematical equation, which you can actually do a PhD on. You can do a PhD on pretty much any equation. Um, but um, calls this, reports it back, um, pulls into the Ruby on Rails app, and reports that in nice JavaScript. So um, uh, I'm not going to go into the code in too much de detail, because I've already, because it's bad. Yeah, that's the first thing. Um, but the, the basic notions here are that you use NumPy, develop an array, and once you have that array and your parameters sorted, that's the hardest part of that, you basically just pull it into some ODE solver. You know, so you're leveraging stuff here that's already well tested, well used, and well uh, utilized by industry professionals. So, you know, uh, Jeremy Howard, who's a data scientist based in the US, he says, like, you, when you're a data scientist, look in 1970s en industrial engineering textbooks, because they've had to challenge, solve a lot of these challenges that we run into day to day. And so then you have like results look like this, and the parameters are useful to uh, to experts. They tell things like you know how many flight levels potential turbulence should occur by, um, and and things like that. Um, previously, the only way to do that was to do simulations yourself or use a very complicated and expensive industrial project uh, product. So what are the key takeaways? Well, the magic quickly problem, I'm borrowing this from Ian uh, Oswald again, but it's you know, that people expect models to be developed very quickly, like a web development project. Um, number two, lack of shared language. As I said, vector spaces, what are you talking about? Um, you know, between software engineers and data scientists, investing in the right tooling really helps to uh, to, to allow success here. And this, the third thing is aimed at kind of the CFOs. There's no CFOs in the room, I don't think. But, uh, you know, to, to take to your CFO, you know, if you want to help your analysts succeed, your business needs to be prepared to invest in tooling. You know, otherwise, this analysis is just done and just sits there inside either the brain of an analyst or a data scientist or on a, like, presentation. And never goes into the sort of tooling that people are actually looking to use. So I'll say a little bit more about this. And this is sim similar to the or and D is not equal to engineering. Um, as you can see, I love XKCD. Um, but this is a magic quickly problem. And this is roughly the same as we run into data scientists. You know, how do you explain what is, you know, because most things just sound the same. You know, um, why can't we do that? And of course, one does not simply build a model in a day, one day. And this, I think I'm going to staple to my wall or at the work. And so I'm going to talk a little bit more about this lack of shared language. Um, services like science ops um, help bridge the gap. Um, but I still do this. You know, watch out for high skew and kurtosis. And people look at me um, like, you know. Um, and you have to think about your team balance. You know, your math folk versus your coders. And you have to think about like, how you're going to get them to integrate and work together well. And it really is impossible to condense several years of a mathematics course to a software developer in a few weeks. I know from trying. Um, but do try to teach the fundamentals. And do try to bring these terms up so that, that, so that your stakeholders will begin to use this more advanced language. So I'm going to elaborate a bit more on this invest in tooling uh, remark. That, um, so for your analysts and your data science succeed, you need to invest in tooling. Um, this, this idea of innovation tokens comes from Drew McFlooney at Etsy. And Drew McFlooney said, your company gets three innovation tokens. How do you want to spend them? And it's a very interesting problem, you know, question, you know, because you can easily solve the wrong problem, you know, and the wrong problem, solving the wrong problem is a huge challenge, you know, because we all do it, you know, uh, we innovate on something that isn't quite as relevant to the business or the stakeholders uh, as it could be. And this third point is sort of as an opinionated point as well. I think there's a huge scope for entrepreneurs to take apart uh, advantage of this arbitrage opportunity. 
a build good tooling to empower data scientists by building platforms. You know, and why has really hit something very interesting. I'm going to talk about some of the other companies that are doing these things as well. But you know, these are sort of things. You know, how do you get to, like you know? So rather than deal with that unicorn uh, uh, like job spec, just take a statistician and re you know let him build things in his own language, and let a tool solve all that operational stuff, and expose things nicely in an API. You know, why should they have to be uh, faffing around with EC2 or, or your know, complicated bash scripts and data pipelines. And this product solves an organizational scale problem. And I'm very fascinated by organizational scale problems. How do you share that knowledge across your organization? I was chatting to a friend recently who works for an insurance firm. He says one of the biggest challenges they have is that their understanding of risk models is centralized. It's not distributed across their very large multinational organization. And so I said, you know, you should uh, you know, invest in data products. And he said, oh, I haven't seen a talk about this. And I said, I'm giving one in uh, Florence. <laughs> so you should look at check it out. So there's some alternatives to Y Hat HQ that I know of. Um, I didn't use any of these because documentation wasn't the same at the time. But I know that these things are improving dramatically. There's Domino. Uh, the top right-hand corner there is Sense.io. Um, they roughly do the same thing. Um, the collaborative platforms allow RESTful API to be exposed. Amazon, former uh, employers, have uh, released an Amazon uh, machine learning platform. But that's only ML specific, so I wouldn't work for this particular problem. And plus your code gets locked up and all these sort of things. I don't really understand how their machine learning platform works. And of course, if you're doing this internally, you can just build an I. Python notebook and with widgets, etc., and share the knowledge like there. But that doesn't work when you have external stakeholders because there's huge security flaws in the IPython notebook. So lessons learned. I can write a model in Python and have it deployed, so I'm useful. Um, software engineers aren't data scientists. They shouldn't be expected to write models on code. I was chatting to Eddie Bell about this. You know, there's just a notion that they can just you know, you can hand off this spec, but it's not quite that simple. The third point is the, probably the most important point from this talk, but models only provide value when they are in production. And getting the information from the stakeholders is really valuable in improving models. The successes. Uh, within a few months, it's possible to have an analytics product in production using information from a variety of APIs. No idea how else to do this other than teaching myself PMML. Total development time, uh, three months with five people, only two including myself and a back-end engineer were full-time because the rest were distributed on other projects and consulting engagements. Development time includes time for us to learn the main specific knowledge like the models, API, etc. How long do I have left? Okay. I'm going to finish a little bit ahead of time. But I'm sure there will be plenty of questions looking at the faces and to the audience. Um, so there's other kind of data products here, right? Credit risk modeling, fascinating problem. Uh, customer attrition modeling, customer churn modeling, all these sort of things. Recommendation engines aren't so interesting to me mathematically because they're just linear algebra. But, um, uh, and airline delay analysis, something I worked on myself. A very interesting problem. Uh, very interesting problem in how do you actually make money out of that. Um, the list goes on. So if you want to learn more, I really, really recommend you check out the Y Hat uh, uh, HQ's uh, uh, website and their blog. They have lots of great examples. They've got a beer recommendation engine. Um, as an Irishman, I just love beer recommendation engines. Um, and uh, and, and, their, and their platforms are very useful, and, and they're continuously developing this. Um, and that's my email address if you want to chat to me personally about any of these things. So I don't give many talks, but when I do, I do Q&A. So I think that's the end of everything. I thank you very much for listening to my talk. Thank you very much for a nice talk. Any question? Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you for your talk. Uh, You're welcome. Would you? I was quite quickly checking the Y Hat AQ 
Uh, it seems that it's kind of a, a um, PAS, it's like a platform as a service. I'm not sure if it's a platform as a service. But it's a platform as a service, okay. but it's cloud independent and data, s data center independent. But their free version runs okay. on AWS as far as so I So I think, I'm thinking there are quite a few people, uh, like executives, that regardless of the size of the company, that would get quite nervous in delegating a, a, a predictive model to someone else's platform, whatever it is, is because you are you're giving away precious Spectral data. property, yeah, yeah. And um, and it also affects how the the whatever the code base or the models will be then managed as a legacy software throughout like multiple releases or evolution or whatever the 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 roadmap of the code is so and i'm not thinking of specifically a size of a company i'm, I'm i have the broad range from tesla to the company where i work with is like 50 people and they will throughout the the range i think it's it's better seen as software products internally developed because of ownership maintainability blah 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 so what did you have any did you have experience of this kind of reaction from yeah so frankly that is uh is a uh, uh challenge and it depends on how open-minded uh, the actual implementation of this you know was done on an internal data center you know they because they why had allow you to do all those sort of things um, as far as I know um, I've since left the company that I was working on this with so I don't know what's going to happen in the future and I have no stake in that but um, yeah I can see what you're what you're getting at but I mean, you also need to think about it in terms of like tool development. So, you know, you could write your own, but do you have the resources to do that, you know, internally? I know like Amazon and Facebook do, right? Because they have machine learning deployment platforms and all these sort of things. But just, you know, depending on what size of company you're in. But I do appreciate the, the fear of loss of intellectual property. And I don't have a very easy answer to that. I'd love to hear if you have an easy answer to that one. My experience is just that you tend to do the Google search and <laughs> select all the tools you would like to use, and then when it comes at the meeting and taking a decision, it's just okay. It's scaling up the team three times maybe, and delaying a bit the delivery, couple of months, and ha keep everything internally. Although I would definitely <laughs> have prefer to have some time saved and rely on something. Any other questions? Hi. So, um, the problem you have just um, depicted is quite interesting because uh, at my company we had recently the same problems. We made a model in Python yeah. and our website is in Ruby. And then, well, basically what we do, what we ended up doing is the model calculates some weights, we push those weights to a table, and then, and these things crash three times already. So after one month, we're still waiting to have this in production. So I didn't quite, I knew the Y Hat people from their blog, mostly. Uh, could you tell us something more about how they actually solve the problem? Because I think I kind of lost that bit in the presentation. So I understood you use them, but yeah, I, I use them on this project. Um, uh, I use it for my own little examples myself. Um, I just harass them all the time and like, ask them lots of questions. Um, but uh, my understanding is that they use like a, sort of an analytics uh, load balancer and they have like an, a model uh, uh, thing on the back end. And they use this all by clever core of managing of their cloud services, you know, depending on how your load was doing. So there, it, it, you know, when we tested this, it worked very well because it scaled up very quickly. You know, 
you know, by just running lots of requests. Um, you know, everything's exposed by a RESTful API and uh, so easy integration to any decent, uh, you know, software language, good libraries, et cetera, et cetera. I think it would probably solve a bit of the problem you're, uh, you're, you're running into. Because I've seen that happen before in terms of like data pipeline jungles, you know, that, you know, really is like bash script calls, root SQL calls, you know, Python, you know, Python model running in the background there. So, um, as I answer your question, that's all that I understand off the top of my head. Um, they're in their white paper on their, on their uh, website, I think they go into detail of what their actual underlying architecture is. So it's worth, uh, it's worth a read. Okay, so time is over. Thank you very much again, Peter, for your talk. Thank you.